world, I'm Missy, the Time Machine Teacher, and today we are on Unit 5 of the amazing review Race to a 5 for the AP exam. On this channel, we talk about all things history. If that sounds like something you're interested in, make sure and hit subscribe and don't forget to turn on your notifications so that you don't miss a thing. Grab your notebooks, let's get started with Unit 5. Unit 5 is from 1750 to 1900. Voltaire actually wrote a letter about this in 1772 when he was writing to a friend and he said, My dear philosopher, doesn't this appear to you to be the century of revolutions? And in fact, he was right on point because it really was. Not only in Europe and Asia, but also around the world, there were political upheavals and these challenges to what had always been as far as government goes. A little bit more context for you during this period is that people are becoming more and more connected through trade. New technology is fostering this, such as the locomotive and telegraphs. The increased use of machinery to produce goods was also happening throughout the world, which will bring about a different revolution, not a political one, but an industrial one. As this global trade increases, countries try to protect their power and their profits. As this global trade increases, countries try to protect the places that they're getting their resources from in order to increase their profits. However, these lands sometimes rebelled against foreign powers and control. The United States is the first to rebel and several revolutions will happen after that, which we'll get into in this video. Industrialization will lead to reorganization of the states. Many people will start thinking more nationalistic and have a desire to be their own country versus a part of a large empire. A demand for labor brings about huge human migration throughout the world, which will influence countries as well. Let's get into the revolutions, starting off the American Revolution. During the 17th and 18th centuries, the American colonies were allowed to have some local autonomy, meaning that they were allowed to have some authority in the way the colonies were governed. But by the 1760s, the British are pushing harder to get more control and more revenues from the colonies. They were basically trying to pay for the war with France. So they imposed new taxes on the colonies. Now, here's the problem. The colonists were not represented in Parliament. Therefore, they didn't have a say in any of these new policies. By not allowing them in Parliament, it also denied their identity as true Englishmen, which colonists felt that they were Englishmen. It challenged the colonists' economic interest, and it also challenged their autonomy within the colonies. Increased taxes, not having a say in Parliament, not being able to go into the Ohio River Valley once the French and Indian War was won, all of these are reasons why the colonists started the American Revolution, to break away from the king and become free. They sent the Declaration of Independence to the king, declaring that they wanted to be free, and with that, they broke away from the king's power. This eventually leads to war with Great Britain, the Americans win, and there are several effects to the American Revolution. One is that even though they were fighting for freedom of all, supposedly, they were really only fighting for the freedom of white men. The government will mostly stay in the hands of the elite after the Americans win their freedom. Another effect is that they do create a government based on democratic principles and ideas, most of which they borrow and use from classical Roman and Greece ideas, most of which they borrow bits and pieces of classical Roman and classical Greek ideas. They also borrow ideas from the Enlightenment, which can be seen in the US Constitution. Another effect of the American Revolution is that it influenced other revolutions. The American Revolutionary War ended in 1783, and in 1789, the French Revolution started. The French had helped in the American Revolution and helped the colonists of America win. There were many French who were returning to France knowing the ideals of the American Revolution and taking them back to France with them. Context of the French Revolution is that the French government was facing bankruptcy. They had attempted to modernize the tax system, but the upper classes had opposed it. The tax system was based on the three estates, 
The first estate were the clergy, the second estate were the nobles, and the third estate were the peasants. The peasants were 98% of the population, but they paid the majority of taxes, with the top percent of the population being only 2% and paying the least amount of taxes. This was a problem for the lower classes, and the bourgeoisie, who are the rising middle class and a part of the third estate, are also very upset by this. In 1789, when the estates general convened, which was somewhat like a parliament or a congress, the third estate broke off and declared themselves the National Assembly. They wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen, which is modeled after the Declaration of Independence and has many Enlightenment ideas within it, and they declared themselves independent. And this started the French Revolution. The French Revolution was very brutal and bloody. King Louis XIV and Marie Antoinette were both beheaded at the end of it. And after the French Revolution, the Reign of Terror occurred where there were many beheadings of nobles and elite throughout that time period. There are a couple of differences between the French and the American Revolution. One difference is that French women were more involved in the French Revolution than women in the American Revolution. The French Revolution was driven by social conflicts, whereas the American Revolution wasn't. After the Reign of Terror, Napoleon Bonaparte will eventually take over in 1799. He believes in social equality, but he does get rid of liberty. He also wants to conquer more of Europe and build a vast empire. He imposes revolutionary practices on conquered areas, such as ending feudalism. He wants equality and rights for men. He insists on religious tolerance and he codifies the laws. However, resentment against French domination happens throughout Europe in the places that he takes over and nationalism rises. He is also unsuccessful in taking over Russia because of the Russian winter. Basically, the winter defeated him. In 1791, the Haitian Revolution starts. Haiti was a French colony, and so they begin to think, shouldn't we have our freedom now that France has their freedom? It's also very complicated because there were several different classes within Haiti. The first class are the Grand Blancs. They're the ones that hold most of the power. They're of European descent. Then we have the Petit Blancs, who are small farmers, merchants, or poor whites, the free people of color, and the slaves at the bottom. The Grand Blancs want more autonomy and control, and the Petit Blancs want equal rights with the Grand Blancs. However, the Grand Blancs don't agree that the Petit Blancs should have equal rights. And at the very bottom, the slaves, of course, want their freedom. Warring factions begin to face off with each other, and eventually the slaves gain power. They are led by Toussaint. Under his leadership, they were able to overthrow the French. This is the only successful slave revolt in world history and resonates throughout the world with other slave populations. As a matter of fact, many white slave owners tried to keep this knowledge from their slaves because they didn't want it to spur on other revolts. Despite their trying, it did inspire other slave revolts throughout the world and caused fear among the white slave holders. At the end, they declare equality for all slaves and divide the large plantations into smaller farms. Another effect of the Haitian Revolution is that because of Napoleon's defeat and the fact that he needed money, he will sell the Louisiana Purchase to the United States. Let's talk now about the Latin American revolutions. There are several different social classes in Latin America that makes it complicated, that makes for complications as well. In Latin America, we had the native-born elites, who are called the Creoles, and they were offended by the Spanish monarchy's effort to control them. They didn't have a traditional local self-government, so at first the revolutions were very limited, and their society was very authoritarian and very strictly divided by social class. However, whites were vastly outnumbered. In 1808, Napoleon invaded Spain and put royal authority in disarray. At that time, Latin America was forced to take action. Leaders of the revolution sought the support of poor people and appealed to the lowest classes. Unfortunately, it was impossible to unite all of Latin American colonies because of regional ties. Unlike in the American Revolution where the colonies all united, that didn't happen in Latin America. Eventually, they would receive independence. However, after independence, the government was very unstable. While the U.S. grew more stable and wealthy, the Latin American countries became increasingly instable 
underdeveloped, undemocratic, and impoverished. Let's talk long-term effects of the revolutions. These revolutions will influence other revolutions to happen in Europe, more voting rights will come to males after the revolutions. The ideals of the revolutions will also inspire abolitionist movements, feminist movements, and nationalist movements. Eventually, the abolition of slavery will occur, and more and more nationalism will spread. Let's talk about the difference between nation versus nationalism. Nationalism is more about identifying with your cultural identity. Nation is about humans dividing into territories by that culture or identity. During this time frame, science also weakens the hold that religion had on people. Old loyalties start to die out, which makes the idea of a nation more likable. Nationalism becomes very powerful in the 1800s, which reawakens the older idea of joining together culturally. Nationalism also inspires political unification of Germany and Italy. It inspires separatist group movements where cultural groups want to be separate from the vast empire and be their own nation. And it fuels the already pre-existing rivalries in Europe. Moving on now to the Industrial Revolution, which starts in the mid 1700s. Context of the Industrial Revolution is that before the Industrial Revolution, many people manufactured in their homes. It's called cottage industries. Whatever you wanted to make, you made in your home. And oftentimes it was much slower than factory production. For example, if I were to make this pen in a cottage industry, I would make each part separately. When I put it together, it would be different than the next pen that I make. Once we go into factories, production will be quicker. It will be longer hours. There are definitely some drawbacks to the factories, which we'll talk about. But one thing that happens is what's called interchangeable parts, which means that now this pen is the same every time I make it. So if a part of it breaks, I can get another part to fix it and I don't have to get rid of the whole thing. Whereas in cottage industry, the parts could not interchange. They were unique for that specific item. Before the Industrial Revolution happens, we have the Agricultural Revolution, which brings about new technology and advancements in farming. That makes food production quicker, which means that less people are needed to grow the crops. In the 15 and 1600s, the enclosure movement occurs, where large landowners bought up smaller farms in order to incorporate it into their farms. This will leave several people without occupations and force urbanization to go and look for jobs. When the Industrial Revolution happens, there are plenty of workers who are in need of jobs. There's also a large growth of population that occurs in the 17 and 1800s. In 1400, there were around 375 million. During the 17 1800s, the population continues to increase. There was an energy crisis where wood and coal start to become more scarce. The Industrial Revolution looks to solve these problems by allowing new technology and new energy sources. Fossil fuels such as coal and iron and natural gas will replace wood and wind, water and muscle power. New technology comes about like the textile industry, food processing, the coal steam engine, powered locomotives, and faster ocean going ships. Later, technology will include electricity, telephone, telegraph, rubber, printing, and much more. All of this new technology also brings changes in agriculture, like the use of fertilizer and mechanical reapers. The Industrial Revolution starts in Europe, but why is that? That's a good question, and one that you definitely need to know. Europe's internal development favored innovation. They were small, they were small and highly competitive states. Monarchs needed revenue which pushed them to ally with the merchant class. Small groups of merchants were offered privileges in exchange for loans and payments to the government. As a result, some places were even run by merchants, such as Venice and Holland. Europe is also in a great location for trade. There's a high demand for Indian cotton, which promotes innovation within Europe. Europe eventually gets cotton and sugar from the American colonies. And some historians say that the reason that Europe was able to industrialize so quickly was because they had access to resources coming from the New World at an inexpensive price. 
Industrial Revolution spreads throughout Europe quickly, but it has its start in Great Britain. One reason for that was the enclosure movement, which we spoke about earlier in this video, which basically forces small farmers to sell out their lands and move into the city in order to find jobs. Britain also has several colonies in the Caribbean, in the Americas, and later in India where they can get raw materials. Great Britain's political life incorporates merchants and favors businessmen with the laws that are created from Parliament. They also have a vast amount of infrastructure such as canals and roads which allow for better transportation. Patents protect inventors in Great Britain which influences them to create more. Parliament also has power to check royal authority which in turn will favor private enterprise. Science and technology are also intertwined with the government in Great Britain. Britain has a large supply of coal and iron, which makes industrializing possible. And one last reason is that Britain's society adjusts well to the social changes. British social classes at the time were made up of British aristocracy, who were the landowners who leased the land to the farmers. This class does decline during the Industrial Revolution, but they managed to hold on to their wealth because of the participation that they had in colonial administration. The middle class is made up of wealthy factory owners, bankers, and merchants, many of whom participate and gain seats in Parliament. Also a part of the middle class were small business owners, doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers, journalists, and scientists. Politically, the middle class were liberals and favored a constitutional government. They supported private property and free trade. Women in this class were mostly housewives and participated in domestic life. Lower middle class were people in the service sector, such as salespeople, police, bank tellers, and the laboring class was the lowest class. This was 70% of Great Britain's population. They were the ones who suffered most from the Industrial Revolution. These were mostly people who moved from the countryside and looked for jobs in the city. At the time, cities are very unsanitary and overcrowded. Many of the laboring class lived in slums or tenant buildings. They worked long hours for low wages. It was very monotonous work. They did the same thing over and over and over. Child labor was also very bad at the time. Because of the low wages, many times parents had to send their children to work as well, and it was dangerous for the children to work around the machinery in the factory. Children were used in mines as well, which is also very dangerous. Unlike the cottage industry, in the factories, there's direct supervision and enforcing discipline. Farm work had also been working close to your family, less strict with the discipline, and it was kind of making your own hours. They did work long hours, but it was more set on the family and, and what was good for the family. Young, unmarried women also worked in the factories and sometimes they were taken advantage of by male bosses. Social protest occurred as a result of these horrible working conditions. Workers formed groups where they helped each other. For example, they would pay a small fee and that money would go towards insurance or sick pay for people who got hurt. Those who were banned from starting a union would sometimes destroy the factory in protest and some joined political movements. Later on in the 1800s, laws would be passed to protect children. Those younger than 10 couldn't work in coal mines, and by 1881 in Great Britain, education was mandatory. Another effect of the Industrial Revolution was the creation of socialism by Karl Marx. He wrote that capitalism was too damaging to the lower class. He thought it was unstable and doomed to collapse, and he based this upon his experiences and what he saw in Great Britain at the time. He rejected social class and he saw this utopian community where everyone was on the same level and everyone had exactly what they needed. His ideas inspired the Labor Party. They called for social democracy, which would reject the social classes. More extreme beliefs of Marxism will eventually become communist. Improved working conditions help people move away from these ideas. For example, in Great Britain and Germany, the creation of the middle class helped with these ideas going by the wayside. Wages rose because of unions. Cheap imported food improved the diets of the poor. Child labor laws and regulations put on factories. Sanitary reform as well as unemployment process helped as well. Another effect of the Industrial Revolution was increased mass migration. 
In 1800, less than 1% of the total world population were Europeans. By 1930, that rose to 11% because of mass migration. The experience of immigrants coming to North America versus Latin America was very different. In America, newcomers were seen as un-American. They were blamed for crime and labor unrest. Immigration does contribute to Western expansion in America. There were also more industrial jobs in North America versus Latin America. In Russia, free serfs went to Siberia and Central Asia in search of land and more freedom. By the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution will spread to the U.S., Japan, and Russia. In the New England states of the Americas, textile factories were started. Railroad companies eventually received land grants. Tax breaks were given to large companies. Mass production was used especially with interchangeable parts, which I explained in the beginning of this video. Henry Ford started building cars using the assembly line, and the Sears Roebuck catalog became a way to sell items. Here's an example of that, and you can see here, it's basically a catalog of all kinds of items that you could buy at the time. This was how you went shopping at this time. In Russia, there's still a monarchy, which means no national parliament, no legal political parties, no nationwide elections. Basically, the czar ruled unchecked. Serfdom became illegal in 1861, but there was a vast cultural and social gap between the classes. In the US, change came from farmers and businessmen who took part of the political system in various ways. In the 1860s, Russia knew they needed to catch up with the rest of Europe, but change had to come from the state. By 1900, Russia was fourth in the world for producing steel and other major industries such as coal, textiles, and oil. The middle class starts to rise and many object to the Tsar's control. 5% are factory workers and they become radical, mostly because they couldn't express their concerns to anyone. A small group of them educated themselves in Marxism socialist and started a small political party. They started educating other workers and eventually this will lead to the Russian Revolution and the abdication of the Tsar. When we last left Latin America, they had just won the revolutions, but were still not in very good shape. Their populations were low, they had many flooded silver mines that weren't usable, abandoned farms, empty national treasuries, regional revolts, and political life was very unstable. By the 19th century, they did improve stability though through industrialization. Latin America experienced an export boom in exporting goods. For example, Mexico exported silver, Chile exported copper, Bolivia exported tin. Much of the profits went to build railroads in order to get the products to market faster. They wanted to become more like the Europeans and to attract European immigrants. Many urbanized, but the lower class stayed impoverished and mostly rural. Government pushed many farmers off of their land, especially if they were indebted to landowners. Then many became dependent laborers. The Mexican Revolution happens in 1917 when they overthrow the dictator. They get a new constitution, give more rights to the workers, and redistribute the land. One difference though is that the Industrial Revolution never really happens in Latin America the way it does in North America. There were some factories built, but not very many. Because of the social structure and the fact that many are too poor to buy manufactured goods, they didn't really have a demand for manufactured goods. The wealthy were the ones who reaped the benefits from exporting, so they didn't really have a reason to manufacture. And their capital mostly came from Europe, which they became too dependent upon. Let's move on now to China. China suffers greatly from the Opium Wars and trying to keep the British out, which we'll talk about later in Unit 6. But once the British get into China, the Qing Dynasty know that they have no choice but to modernize and industrialize. The Qing Dynasty starts what's called the Self-Strengthening Movement, which was a way for the government to face internal and external problems in China at the time. They want to strengthen their military and training, and they use European advisors to do that. More demand for reform comes after the Sino-Japanese War from 1894 to 1895. Reformers want to get rid of the civil service exam and corruption as a whole. So they want to industrialize in the Western way, both in commerce and medical systems. 
Enter Empress Shushi. She is the aunt of the emperor and very powerful at the time. She was a conservative and at first she rejects the reforms. She didn't like new technology or foreigners, so she overthrows the emperor and puts him in prison. Eventually she realizes that civil service exams have got to go. Even though they at first were supposed to promote merit, because of corruption in the 1800s, they no longer did that. And many wealthy were creeping in and getting privileges through paying off the officials. Due to that corruption, she abandons the system. However, overall, she doesn't want to modernize. So she promotes and leads the Boxer Rebellion, which was basically a rebellion to get rid of all foreigners in the country. Despite this, many Chinese continue steps to modernize. Unfortunately for China, Japan is a threat and they need the Western countries help in order to keep the Japanese at bay. And so they allow the Europeans back in and the Europeans want to trade. In 1911, change will come to China when it becomes a republic. In contrast to China, the Japanese welcome industrialization. They see it as something that they have to do. One reason is because they saw how China suffered from the Opium Wars and trying to keep the Westerners out. Up until the 1800s, Japan had also been isolated. But in 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry comes knocking. He is asking for trade with the US. At first he's denied, but then he brings more ships and the Japanese decide to allow the trade to happen. In 1868, the Meiji Restoration occurs and the Shogun is overthrown and the Emperor replaces him. At this time, they abolish feudalism and start a constitutional monarchy. New laws establish equality before the law and no cruel punishments. They reorganize and modernize the military, getting rid of the samurai, put in a new school system, build roads and railroads, and invest in industry, such as wine and shipbuilding, tea and silk, and new weaponry. There was resistance to this though, especially with the samurai. They were dismissed and no longer allowed to carry their swords. Also, the Bushido Code was no longer recognized. Some of them joined the government at this time, but others resisted. The resistance fought the government, but eventually lost. All of the modernization was funded by a high agricultural tax. Moving on now to the Ottoman Empire and how they industrialized. Sultan Mahmud II is the one who abolishes the Janissaries and develops new artillery training with the help of the Europeans. Military officers were no longer allowed to collect taxes from the public as their salary. Now they were paid by the government, which made them a little bit more loyal to the government. They built railroads and formed a postal system, and they reorganized in what was called the Tanzimat. This was basically where they tried to get rid of corruption. They created secular education and colleges, created laws, updated the legal system. Christians didn't like it because they felt like it was threatening their autonomy, and Muslims didn't like it because it was threatening their traditions. The economy at this time was pretty good. The Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, and at that time, the food prices dropped in the Ottoman Empire. There was an increase of wealth and trade. Banking increased because workers were paid in cash versus in product. Despite all this, industrialization was slow to spread. Most new jobs were given to men and mostly the reforms benefited only the men. Overall, change during this period was that large corporations increased throughout the world. Examples of these would be John D. Rockefeller, who had an oil company, Cecil Rhodes, who owns De Beers Diamond Company, and Alfred Krupp, who uses the Bessemer process to make steel. Corporations start to sell stock in their companies, and individuals buy the stocks, they're called stockholders, and they start to make money off of the dividends of the stocks. Because standards of living rises, people can afford to buy more things, which brings about mass consumerism, especially in the middle class. And political movements lead to changes for workers, such as labor unions and more support that way. Voting rights will spread to men who don't own land. However, women's voting rights will not occur until the 1900s. And that wraps up Unit 5. Thank you so much for listening. And if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure and do so hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. Give this video a thumbs up before you go and stick around for the outtakes. I'll see you next time. Shortly after the reign of terror, Napoleon Bonaparte
Bonus heart. <laughs> eventually, these fights, eventually, ah! And Britain's society adjusts, Britain's society, okay. 